Reagan and the Red Sox. Long drive. Ball game's over. Kevin Romine has won it. Seven to six, Boston. Quickly, this game is over. Roger Clemens with a tremendous ninth inning. Chopper up the middle. Morgan's Magic, the story of the 1988 Boston Red Sox. The color of spring turned a promising shade of red in Winter Haven, Florida, as the Red Sox arrived with enviable starting pitching. But after a losing season, their chief concern was the bullpen, a subject that had sent the trade winds blowing. One of the biggest problems we had was our bullpen. We felt the major thing to go to the winter meeting was to shore the bullpen up. And we went in with the intention of trying to find a reliever that might do that. We came back from the winter meetings with Lee Smith. We traded Calvin Chiraldi and Al Nipper for Smith. And I felt it really had shored the bullpen up considerably. I felt going to spring training that this ball club had a chance to contend. I knew the race would be tough. But I really felt that we had a chance to be in that race and be in the race all year. And so Smith, I felt, was a major part of our ball club at that time. And so with all the components in place, the Red Sox went north, hale and hearty, and hungry for a division title. Sweet Italian sausage, ice cold soda. Right here, we got them right here. Red Sox, how many? Red Sox all the way, you know it. Time, they say, begins on opening day. And in Boston, it began against Detroit with a barrage of strikeouts from Roger Clemens, 11 to be exact. Crowd looking for him to strike out the side. And he Side corner, Roger Clemens strikes out the side in the second. By the 10th inning, with a score all even at three, Lee Smith was summoned for the first time. But despite the pleadings of a packed house, Smith's debut was spoiled. Not up to his usual stuff, he got beaten by a home run. And suddenly, April felt like a cruel month indeed. But shaking off the chill of opening day, Smith made swift work of the Tigers in his next outing. And as if to say, have no fear, picked up the first of four consecutive saves. It's taken by Evans. He tags him out for the double play. And this game is over. Gantner called out on a breaking pitch, and Smith strikes out the side in an awesome performance in the ninth inning. Smith fulfilled his promise as the reliever the Red Sox could count on time and again. Trouble is, they never counted on Bob Stanley's preseason injury, which sidelined him for the start of the season. To make matters worse, Rich Gedman would soon join him when, six days into the season, he broke his toe and would be lost until the end of May. With Gedman out of action, the Red Sox clearly had to secure a new catcher. So enter Rick Cerrone a veteran at the position, and as it turned out, a choice pickup. For openers, Cerrone arrived with a hot bat in his first nine games, hit 424. That, plus dependable defense, made him most welcome at Fenway. The Sox got even more encouraging signs from Ellis Burks, their dashing center fielder and much talented sophomore who would ring up a 294 average and 92 RBI. Add to that 18 homers and 25 steals, and the numbers add up to a great beginning. Ellis Burks got great skills. Ellis Burks is just a young kid, still learning the game, still getting better every day. He's just scratching the surface of his talent. He's got speed, he's got great defensive reaction on balls in the outfield. He's a good center fielder, he has a strong arm and a very accurate arm. All those skills are there. We haven't seen the best of Ellis Burks yet. That's yet to come too, I think. But in April, he gave a good indication. Hitting 385, Burks led the Sox to a team record 14 wins and everything seemed to fall into place. That is, until misfortune struck in Detroit on April 21st. 
Ellis Burks up with the bases loaded and two outs. High and deep to right center field. Two runs have scored. Owen is being waved home. Owen will score. Burks to third. He's safe at third with a triple. That was the good news. The bad news was that when Burks slid into third, he jammed his wrist, an injury that would bother him the rest of the season and would now put him out of action for a week. Still, there was an upside to all this. That was pitching in general and Roger Clemens in particular. Following back-to-back -back Cy Young awards, Clemens opened the season with a flourish, winning eight of his first ten games. It's a great feeling when you're standing out in left field and, and you watch Roger Clemens pitch because a lot of times that's exactly what you're doing. You're watching him pitch. There are certain nights he just goes out and blows people away. And Roger Clemens can be awesome, can be overpowering. Uh, I guess sometimes we expect so much of him. We see him out there on days when he just overmatches the hitters. He's the most dominating I've ever seen. I mean, in, in my time, I just can't... You know, I can't compare it with years gone by like a lot of people, but I just can't see anybody being more dominating who, in whatever era than Roger has been. He's, uh, he's a special talent. Even with a late season slump, Clemens would record 291 strikeouts, most by an American League pitcher in 11 years. If the numbers seem earth shattering, just witness the Rocket Man's truly explosive force. Sending out explosives right from the start, Clemens won five of his first seven games by shutout. Roger Clemens, a three-hit shutout. And a shutout for Roger Clemens. Roger Clemens with his third straight shutout against the Milwaukee Brewers. He has a real trust of his ability. I mean, he trusts himself more than anybody, and he's more prepared than anybody. He knows he's going to beat him down, that he's going to put more pressure on that guy than they can put on him, and they can't beat him, and he knows they can't beat him. Despite a team slump in May and June, Clemens continued to fire away and wound up the first half of the season with a 12 and 5 record. As far as dominating and carrying a ball club, it was Roger. I thought there's no there's nobody better. And, and he was really a big part of getting us at least, I mean, just keeping us nine games out. I mean, it could have been a lot worse. True, but as well as Clemens pitched, the Sox plunged below 500, and John McNamara was understandably worried. On May 20th, Clemens pitched a career-high 10 innings in a game that typified the team's troubles. The Sox went ahead, lost the lead, and then rallied back, only to come up short. Suddenly in the May, we fell apart offensively. We didn't hit. We'd have bases loaded, nobody out couldn't score. We'd have first and third, nobody on couldn't score. We just couldn't drive running. The first half we were so inconsistent. Uh, we would get good pitching and not good hitting and, and vice versa. High and deep to left field. This should tie it up. We started second guessing ourselves. Uh, the paper, everybody in the media was second guessing the Red Sox and uh, uh, there was talk about McNamara being, uh, being fired and, and making a change there. Um, so it put a lot of pressure on us, and pressure that uh, really took its toll on the team. Down and out of contention in the middle of June, the Red Sox fell 10 games out of first place, a long way from the top and a lot of ground to make up. The view was nonetheless encouraging in left field as first time all star Mike Greenwell was producing whopping numbers. En route to a 325 average, Gator went on a mad spree in June. And during a 19 game hitting streak, he collected 21 RBIs in eight games. Home run, Mike Greenwell. His fourth in the last three games. After a shining rookie season, Greenwell proved brilliant as a sophomore. Besides 22 homers and 119 RBIs, he would strike out a mere 38 times. All that from the man who in June landed the most enviable job of all, 
when he turned cleanup hitter. Anytime you can have uh, Wade Boggs, Marty Barrett, and Dwight Evans sitting in front of you, uh, you're going to have a lot of opportunities to drive in runs. It definitely helped me. Uh, I just responded to that, uh, that pressure situation, and that's the type of hitter I am. I like to be uh, under the gun, as they say, or, or have the pressure on you, and uh, there's no better spot in the lineup than to be the number four hitter. Mike, on, on different occasions, carried us, got big hits, won big ball games for us. I think he's improved in the outfield. He keeps working at it and making himself a better outfielder all the time. I just think that Mike Greenwald can become an all-star player and be there for a long time. Some may argue Greenwell has already hit the big time. Even with Greenwell, Boston's future was marked by imminent signs. In late June, the Red Sox won five straight, but then everything crashed. Hit down the line and right and deep. Does it stay fair? No. A foul ball and just barely foul. That's not a foul ball. That's a home run there. That ball went to the other side of the pole. Watch this ball. It just caroms right off the pole. Hits Bang. and no question no about question it. No question about it. Later in the series, it was a similar refrain. And Rice gets into it a little bit. It hangs up. And Wilson comes up for the catch. And will throw to second base for the double play and the triple play. Triple play for the Kansas City Royals. Compounding Red Sox woes, a viral infection in early July sent Bruce Hurst to the sidelines for two weeks. There, he joined Jeff Sellers, who fractured a bone in his pitching hand, depleting the ranks still more. Finally, just after the All-Star break, a weary and beleaguered John McNamara was let go. Although the Sox managed to climb above the 500 mark, they went into the second half of the season in fourth place, trailing the Tigers by nine games. The change in managers came on July 14th, when third base coach Joe Morgan stepped in to fill McNamara's shoes. To many of Boston's homegrown players, the one-time manager of the Pawtucket Red Sox may have been the same old Joe. But every move Morgan made not only worked, it produced a magical effect. Rookie Jody Reed was permanently installed at short. The switch hitting Todd Benziger was given newfound confidence and a job at first base, and the Red Sox got much needed right-handed power from new acquisition Larry Parrish. I remember telling the club that they were a better team naturally than, than they, they had played, but maybe we can't win this thing, but certainly we can creep up the ladder. And if we get up in a second place, who knows after that? But we got there in an awful hurry. Joe Morgan on the verge, perhaps, of his first major league managing victory. What a way this would be to start a major league managing career. And so it began. 16 strikeouts for Roger Clemens and win number one for Joe Morgan. Suddenly, the Red Sox had a new lease on life. They swept a doubleheader, and next day against the Royals, rallied back from a 6 to nothing deficit, finally getting even in the eighth inning when Dwight Evans stepped into the picture. Drive toward the wall, way back, and tied up! One inning later, in the bottom of the ninth, the Red Sox got a little touch of magic from the little-used Kevin Romine, who delivered the killing blow. Here's the pitch. Long drive! Ball game's over! Kevin Romine has won it! Seven to six, Boston! Fenway hearts were pumping with pennant fever as the Sox made it three straight, four straight, five straight. And then, with number six on the line, Larry Parrish came forth. Go 
goes deep to left field. Line drive. Home run. Larry Parrott. Five-nothing Boston. Well, that's what they got him for. Parrish powered the Sox to number six. But next night, the streak was in jeopardy when a 10th inning sacrifice fly capped a Twins comeback in which they took a two-run lead. I was at uh, first base with Todd in the uh, top of the 10th when they scored two runs or so, and we were, saying, we were saying the same thing, like, I can't believe that, but we need to get this big out here. And Todd goes, if we get an out here, you never know. Tying run at third, the winning run at second as the Red Sox climb back. High drive, right field, way back. A home run, the Red Sox win. Todd Benziger. Another hero, another victory, and suddenly five games out. But there was more to this game than a spirited finish. Boston's new manager became known to everyone when he pulled a shocking move in the eighth inning. With Ellis Burks on first and Joe Morgan in need of a bunt, he pinch hit Spike Owen for slugger Jim Rice. Passing up the superstar for a number nine hitter sparked a celebrated protest from Rice and left no doubt as to who was in charge. He felt we had to support Joe, that Joe was the manager of the club. The club had to realize he was running the club. He'd make the decisions, and he was in charge. I've heard it mentioned a few times that Joe did some things to say, to show people that he was the boss and what he said goes. Joe's not that type of manager. He's not the type of guy that needs to make examples or, or, or to do things like that. I think he honestly did it just because he thought it was the right move. And that's just the way it is. It really doesn't matter who it is. He doesn't really play favorites. Maybe not, but every move Morgan made worked like a charm. Hitting heroes gave way to pitching heroes. And with a win streak at seven, Oil Can Boyd dispatched the White Sox with nearly unhittable stuff, making it eight straight and the best start ever for a Sox manager. A win the next day brought it to nine, and then Mike Smithson continued to amaze. With a streak on the line, he set down 19 of the last 20. They've got 10 in a row as Smithson strikes out the side. The Red Sox rolled to 10 in a row, and next night in the White Sox finale, Lee Smith put the finishing touches on a stirring homestand. Struck him out, and this ballgame has come to an end. For Smith, four saves during the streak, and for the Red Sox, 11 in a row. They had not lost at Fenway in a month, and had not lost since Joe Morgan took over. But it was time to take the win streak on the road to Arlington, Texas, where Clemens fired off 14 strikeouts. Strike three, this game is over, and the Red Sox have won 12 in a row. The way things were going, everyone was hoping a little of Morgan's magic would rub off. After every game we won, we went upstairs and we were watching Joe to see if he was betting on any horses or any dog races because we were going to bet right along with him. We won 12 in a row and I got a letter from this guy and he said, Joe, you're using the wrong lineup. Maybe so, but it worked wonders. In 12 games, the Red Sox remarkably climbed from nine games out to one and a half back of first. But next night in still sweltering Texas heat, the string snapped. Slam to left field, it is caught. And the streak is over. Losing only one game in two weeks should not have been cause for alarm. But in that game, the Red Sox quickly came down to earth when they lost oil can Boyd to a sore shoulder. Two days later, the Sox returned home where they had not lost in more than a month. But they were minus a starter. Now when, when Boyd goes down, it looks like Boyd is questionable because of the physical status of him and because of his health being in jeopardy. Uh, we decide we had to get a pitcher. And Joe Morgan has a new pitcher to replace oil can Boyd. The Red Sox have just announced that they have made the trade with the Baltimore Orioles. They have acquired Mike Boddicker. When I first came over, the first game I got to watch, I was charting, I was pitching the next day. And Roger was pitching. It got to be late innings. It was two to two. And Marty Barrett was on third base. Goes to right field. That's going to drop in there. A diving catch by Rob Deere. Coming on to the plate is Marty Barrett. The relay is out at home. A double play ends the inning. And everybody's going, I can't believe you didn't tag on that, you know, and everybody's just harping on it. 
and our coaches, everybody, up and down going, I can't believe he's got all this experience and he didn't tag, he's got to know better than that and all that stuff. And Joe came down and says, hey, relax, everybody makes mistakes. That's all he said and everybody calmed down. Marty came up in the ninth inning, bases loaded off of Hagera. Barrett bangs one into left field, this game is over. The Red Sox win it three to two. For Barrett, a case of redemption. For the Sox, 19 straight at home. And for the newcomer, a case of nerves. Uh, I was nervous because I, I pitched the game. I started the game when they started the streak when I was with Baltimore. And here I was coming in, pitching, trying to extend the streak. And uh, I felt, felt like it was my first game in the big leagues again. I was real nervous. The crowd is into the game early. And what a start for Mike Bonacle. I got a standing ovation twice. Uh, going out to warm up, and then once when I came off the field. So it was exciting. In his Red Sox debut, Boddicker shut out the Brewers into the eighth inning and then left the rest to the bullpen. Bob Stanley got the call and finished the job as the Red Sox finished off the month of July with 20 straight wins at home and a no-lose attitude. I think we went into each game at home thinking they're over there knowing they're at Fenway and it's going to be tough. They might not have been thinking about that. They might have been saying, hey, we can win here just like anybody else. No big deal here. But by us thinking that, I think it gave us that little edge that you need to, to win those close ball games. We just felt like we couldn't lose at home. I mean, the, the Celtics mystique that, that they never lose at home and, and that kind of thing. No hitter carries more of a mystique than Wade Boggs, a magician with the bat who became the first player this century to have six straight 200-hit seasons. A hitter of supreme consistency, Boggs just never cools off. At the end of July, he took over the batting race and went on to hit 366, earning his fourth straight batting title and fifth in the last six years. With such accomplishments, Boggs has already earned a place among the game's batting legends. Line to left. A hit. A double for Wade Boggs. And inside the park, home run for Wade Boggs. Wade Boggs is four for four. 1,200 hits for Boggs. Boggs will have a triple. Boggs gets his fourth hit. He is knocked in three runs. Hitting may be what Boggs does best, but his defense is much improved, and after much hard work, has become a source of pride. You always want to be known as a complete ball player. With me hitting at such a high average, it's, it's very hard for me uh, to get the recognition on my fielding that I do on my hitting. The defense comes a lot harder than the offense does. I have to work a lot harder at it, and, and uh, I go out early and, and take 15, 20 minutes of extra ground balls. And the more you play, the, the better you get. True enough, not only for Boggs, but for the revived Red Sox who were rolling at Fenway. Morgan's magic plus a few small miracles equaled 21 straight wins at home. On August 3rd, with the string on the line, Jody Reed got an offer he couldn't refuse. 4-4, four, four, your score. 3-2, two, two out. Reed bangs one into left field. Base hit. Burks will score. Throw to second base, safe at second. The Red Sox lead by one. Jody Reed, a clutch single, driving in the go-ahead run. The lead held up, and with two down in the ninth, the Red Sox stood one strike away from first place. Strike three, and the streak reaches 22. 22 straight at home, and best of all, tied with the Tigers on top of the East. The Red Sox finally got a taste of first place, but a taste was all it would be. Because on the night of August 4th, the Morgan guarantees seemed to run out. The Sox went to Detroit for a five-game series and collapsed. After climbing up so far so fast, they stumbled and slipped four games back. We played so hard to get to that point to tie Detroit, and we did that. And uh, I think we went in there and just kind of relaxed and, and thought we'd win our share of those ball games, and uh, hopefully win at least two ball games, and hopefully three ball games. Um, and we relaxed a little bit, and the next thing we knew, we turned around, we lost four straight. But all was not lost against the Tigers. In the series finale, the Red Sox needed a lift, 
and knew who to turn to. But I, I knew Harris was going to pitch well that day, and I kind of went out on the limb and said that he was going to spin a beauty and we'd win tomorrow. And the Tiger players, some of them, didn't like that. But can I have an opinion? A prediction was more like it because Hurst was indeed masterful, shutting out Detroit for 10 innings. The, the feeling we had was Bruce was pitching a great ball game and uh, we had to win this game. Uh, you know, and, and we didn't want to let Bruce down and ourselves down. Uh, you know, he was, he was throwing a great ball game and we had just lost four and we needed that fifth ball game. He lost the bat, Benzinger knocks it down, Hurst had to dodge the bat and he got to the bag before Murphy. What a finish for Bruce Hurst, and it's only fitting that Bruce should have the final put out on the score sheet. The first shot out of the year for Hurst, the 13th of his career, and his first win at Tiger Stadium since 1980. Bruce is an intense competitor, really a strong competitor, and he won some very, very big ball games. For his games we had to win, he won. It was by far his best year as a major league pitcher, and it really proved the potential he's got. I've always said since the day I came here that Bruce Hurst was capable of being a 20-game winner. He came very close to being that this year. In fact, Hurst would win 18 games and carry the team much of the way down the stretch. He had become a star, something that seemed impossible seven years ago. 1981, uh, Joe was my manager in Pawtucket. Um, I'd played, that was my sixth year in the minor leagues. And I'm the kind of guy that I figure there's a lot of happy people in the world. And if I don't, you know, they don't play baseball, and if I don't play, I figure I can be one of them. I mean, it's, it's, I don't, you know, baseball players don't have the corner on the market on all the happiness and stuff. And he said, Joe, I think I've had it. I, I'm, I'm going to hang him up. I said, what's wrong, Bruce? He said, well, things aren't too going so hard. I don't like the travel and things of that nature. And this guy said, well, if you don't like the travel, you're certainly in the wrong business. I spent three days holed up in my apartment in Pawtucket, and it wasn't really what I wanted to do. My wife and I, we just couldn't figure out what to do. I called some friends, got some great advice, decided I was going to come back, and it was hard. But, uh, you know, I took a lot of criticism from the players, and probably rightfully so. I mean, they'd been through the whole thing, and it's just as tough for them as it is for me. And uh, <clears throat> came back and made the big leagues at the end of that season. I've never been back since. Here's a guy now that can go out there in the toughest clutch situations and pitch better than the next guy. If I can see the glove, and I can deliver everything I have right at the glove, make the best possible pitch, even if they know it's coming, even if I tip my pitch somehow and they know it's coming, and I hit the, hit the spot perfect, I have the advantage. And they know that I have the advantage. So that to me, that's what I have to do. And I don't get caught up in all the little distractions and things like that. That's when it's, it's my very best. And so because of that, I don't change my, my approach to pitching, whether I'm in Oakland or Detroit or Fenway or wherever. Maybe not. But at Fenway, where left-handers are not supposed to win, Hurst went 13-2. His best stretch came in August, when he was named Pitcher of the Month, going a perfect 5-0, with three of those wins coming at home. Well, I like pitching at Fenway. I don't have any problems pitching there. I mean, it's a great hitter's ballpark, so it works both ways. I mean, I may have a little higher ERA there or something like that, but we're going to score more runs ourselves. So, I mean, that's a wash, as far as I'm concerned. On August 12th, as far as Detroit batters were concerned, facing Hurst was a losing proposition. The Tigers did score early, but after a Boston uprising, the Red Sox took a sizable lead, still working their charms at Fenway. Bob Stanley came on to save it, and the Tigers went down easy. Little looper, Benzinger is under it. Game one goes to Joe Morgan and the Red Sox. A new American League record, 23 straight wins at home. But they didn't stop there. The next day, the Red Sox made it 24, thanks to the truly explosive bat of number 24. The high fly left field. Hangs up, up, and gone. Home run, two nothing Red Sox. Excitation soon turned to frustration when the Tigers overturned the lead. But as if to say, a clout for a clout, Boston countered in the last of the sixth when Evans came up again. High drive, left field. See you later, baby. Home run over everything. Red Sox lead five to four. The shower of power continued as Mike Greenwell hit one out. The floodgates soon opened. The Red Sox added 10 more runs. And in his biggest day of the season, Evans delivered again. 
or the drive deep towards center field. That's going to be extra bases bouncing around at the 420 mark. It will clear the bases. And Evans has a triple. 15 to 4. Seven runs batted in for Dwight Evans. A second straight win by comeback and another glorious day at Fenway. That's out towards second. And it's Jody Reed over. This game is over. A waltz for the Red Sox. As Joe Morgan's crew makes it 24 in a row at home and more important, makes it two in a row over the Tigers. The streak would end next day, but the Sox were well in the race and Dwight Evans was well in the groove. At the not so tender age of 37, Dwight would deliver 111 RBIs, a 293 average, and has always come through with a big hit. He's played, you know, 17 years uh, in the major leagues. He's always talking, trying to help people out. And uh, uh, he goes out, and, he, and you know Dwight Evans is going to go out and make things happen. He, he's the type of player that uh, he goes to the plate, and uh, he's going to try to hit it as hard as he can, as far as he can, and, and, and try to help you win a ball game. He cares about winning, and uh, it's nice to have players on your team that, that really care about winning. With no small amount of desire, plus a sweet swinging bat, Evans reached a plateau in Oakland on May 27th. Dwight Evans has career hit number 2,000. A solid single to center leading off the sixth. 2,000 hits in his big league career for Dwight Evans. An especially gratifying milestone for Evans, whose trademark throughout his career has been defense. He has collected eight gold gloves and continues to leave behind a string of unforgettable plays. Well hit, right field, deep. Evans is going back, back near the wall, and oh, what a catch he made! What a catch by Dwight Evans, and it's a double play. If Dwight's right field exploits seemed to come naturally, his hitting didn't, at least not at first. But by 1981, Evans had found consistency at the plate, and the Red Sox had found a hitter they could rely on. And now, 17 years after Evans was promoted to the majors, the Sox are counting on him still. So no surprise that Dwight figured heavily down the stretch, which on September 4th brought the Red Sox to Anaheim with a chance to reclaim first place. They had lost five of six on the West Coast, and things didn't look much better now as the Angels took a 4-0 lead. But the Sox came back to tie it, and then Larry Parrish led off the 10th with a bang. Parrish sends it high in the air, deep to right center field, way back and gone. Larry Parrish, an opposite field home run. The Red Sox lead six to five. That was all Lee Smith needed as he shut down the Angels for good. are in first place in first place with a lead that would keep growing and growing two nights later West Gardner breezed past the Baltimore Orioles retiring 14 of the last 16 batters for the first complete game of his career the Red Sox boosted their lead to three and a half and then on September 10th in front of a jam-packed house at Fenway Roger Clemens re-emerged from a month-long slump with a brilliant performance against the Cleveland Indians. And it's to Barrett, and this should end it. A one-hitter for Roger Clemens. The Sox kept the momentum going full force. Two days after Clemens threw the first one-hitter of his career, Dennis Lamp polished off the Orioles with help from an airtight infield, which turned three double plays and sparked the Sox to their third win in four games. Next night, Jim Rice, who struggled much of the season after losing his left field job, found his celebrated power stroke and against the Orioles delivered mightily. And it is out of here for a grand slam. Rice's eighth career grand slam beat Baltimore and pushed Boston's lead to four and a half games. Next night, Mike Greenwell also got into the swing. Sparking the Red Sox to victory, he collected hits in all varieties, highlighting his brilliant season with a night to remember. 
Drive toward right field. It's going to drop for a cycle. A cycle for Mike Greenwell. Single, double, triple, and homer. Greenwell's four-star performance capped a red-hot streak in which the Sox proved their resolve, winning eight of ten. They were no doubt primed and pumped up for a critical series with their oldest rivals and now principal contenders. We needed a big win here, especially with the Yankees coming in. We needed to keep the momentum, and uh, uh, it's a good feeling to help your team win. With the Sox up by four and a half, the second-place Yankees came in for a four-game series that produced more than a few jitters and stirred up memories, at least for the media, of the famous Boston Massacre of 1978. I think the front page was, uh, here we go again, uh, another Yankee massacre of Boston and this and that. And, uh, you know, I think there was a lot of panic uh, throughout Boston. Uh, people were, you know, all the reporters were talking about uh, the, the, the team losing the games in 78. And uh, I heard so many times about the, the massacre of 78 and everything. And, you know, and, but I'm sure, you know, three or four years from now, if the same situation comes down, they'll still be talking about the 78. You know, they'll never let that die. We had a little advantage knowing that even if we got swept, we were still going to be in first place. You know, but we still knew it was a big series. We knew if we beat them that we could almost lock them out. But in game one, the Yankees were full of surprises. Most of all, this steal of home by Claudel Washington, which locked Boston out and prompted dire predictions at the old homestead. Everybody I ran into the next day, in their eyes, they, they really felt that this team was, was going to fall and, and we were going to lose those ball games. And uh, we really felt we had something to prove. We had to hopefully put that ghost behind uh, the Red Sox and uh, the fans and ourselves and, and everybody involved. And we wanted to win. The Sox played with a lot more spunk in game two as Marty Barrett started a two-out rally in the fifth. He rips that fair ball past Pagliarulo toward the corner. Boggs on his way to third. Henderson fields it in the corner. Boggs waved in. Santana's throw is not in time. A 3-2 lead for the Red Sox and a comeback that wouldn't quit. Four more runs crossed the plate, and Boston went into the ninth with a 7-4 lead. A lead that was safe and sound in the trusty hands of Lee Smith, who put the Yankees to rest while putting Boston's first place lead back up to four and a half games. In game three, the Yankees and Red Sox battled through an unexpected pitcher's duel. Neither team could muster much offense, and the game went into the eighth, deadlocked at one. If Red Sox pitching wasn't enough to frustrate the Yankees, this eighth inning blow was. getting his 100th RBI of the year. Evans' home run put the Red Sox up 3-1. to one. The lead held up as Bruce Hurst capped a three-hitter by bringing down the house. The win gave Boston a little breathing room on top of the East. And next day, Fenway Hearts were jumping when Ron Guidry got rocked very early and very often. Hit toward the wall and left. High in the air, way back and gone! Number 17 for Ellis Burks. It gives the Red Sox a 3-1 lead. A barrage of Red Sox hits knocked Gidry out in the second inning as Boston went up 7-1, scattering Yankee pennant hopes. Any fears of a Boston massacre disappeared as the Sox took 3-4 to pull six games up and finally rest easy on top of the East with a six-game lead. Of course, as the Red Sox knew all too well, no lead was safe. And just when they thought they had wrapped up the division, the Red Sox went to Toronto and fell flat. A key error in the opener led to Boston's downfall as the Blue Jays continued to confound the Sox, beating them two out of three. And as the Red Sox headed to Yankee Stadium, the pressure was cooking all over again, with three big games to play against the troublesome Yankees. On September 23rd, the Red Sox arrived in New York with trouble in mind, 
And soon, trouble on the scoreboard. The Yankees overcame an early Red Sox run, crushing Red Sox pitching for six runs in two innings. The Yankee assault brought Bedlam to the Bronx, knocking Bruce Hurst out of the game and giving New York a seemingly unsinkable 9-5 lead. With, uh, you know, 40,000 people at Yankee Stadium screaming and yelling, and, and they pretty much thought the Yankees had already won the ball game. And then we just chipped away. We chipped away and chipped away, and there was a feeling on the bench because at the, at the time the Yankees had been struggling, and they, we knew that their, their relief pitching had blown some games. and They could put anybody they had out there and we were going to score if that's what we needed to do. And uh, they felt the same way. They were pounding at us. They were ready to go, and it was just a, a great fight. A great fight in which the Yankees lost the balance of power to Boston. The Red Sox came back with two runs and cut the deficit to 9-7. Then in the top of the ninth, with Jody Reed up and runners at the corners, the Sox kept on coming. Line drive, base hit into left field. Greenwell comes on to score. The Red Sox are within a run, nine to eight. He delivers it to shallow center. Washington charging hard. He does not get it. Burks had to hold up, and he will stop at third. Chopped up the middle. They didn't know who would field it. Burks scores. Here comes Reed. He scores. And the Red Sox have a 10-9 lead. He might get us so fun. And we came in there that you would have thought we'd just won the pennant right at that point. We were all slapping each other, high five, and just, it was a great feeling. Nothing, it seemed, could diminish the excitement of that victory. Not even an embarrassing two-out blunder in the bottom of the ninth next day that cost the Red Sox the game. We knew we'd won 10-9 the night before, and that was a big game for us. And we weren't going to let what happened that Saturday destroy everything we'd worked for. So we were just looking forward to going out there and win the next one. And they did, with a blowout. The Red Sox demolished Yankee pitching for six runs. Lee Smith saved the shutout. And in taking two of three, the Sox left town satisfied but spent. We had so many series back to back to back that were critical. Every series seemed to be critical to us. We had the Detroit series critical, the Yankee series here critical, the Yankee series there critical. And every series our guys were getting up for. We knew that was a big series. And I remember we came back against Toronto the next night and we got beat 11 to 1. And my feeling was, oh no, don't let this happen to us because there was absolutely no intensity. And um, it happened the next night and we go, that better be it. And then the next night, we got beat one to nothing, and we got swept by Toronto. And I remember telling Dewey, um, you know, we lost our intensity. We got to do something to get it back. And he said, uh, we'll be all right. Mike Boddicker was better than all right on September 29th in Cleveland when he retired the first 16 batters. With the frustration of the Blue Jays sweep behind them, the Red Sox came alive at the plate and scored 12 runs. And behind Boddicker's first complete game and first shutout with the Red Sox, Boston clinched a tie for the American League East. Next night, the Sox looked like a cinch to clinch with Clemens pitching, but they lost. The Yankees did too, leaving one last team to worry about. Ground ball to the right. Lansford has it at first, steps on the bag. The A's win their 103rd. The Red Sox are the American League Eastern Division champions. The Brewers' gallant bid has died here at the Coliseum. And it'll be the A's and the Red Sox beginning next Wednesday. It's a heck of a way to have to find out you, you've, uh, you know, clinched the Eastern Division. But uh, uh, like I said, we won enough ball games to win it. And uh, that's, that's what it takes. Uh, uh, it would have been nice to win it on the field and have the celebration. Uh, we had brought the, uh, the swimming goggles to wear so the champagne doesn't get in your eyes the whole nine yards. We were ready for it, and it just didn't happen. You know, and the next day, there was champagne there, and they had, the, uh, they had the, all the plastic up and everything. And maybe if we'd won that Saturday, we might have felt a little better, too. But we lost that game, too, and we came in. It was just like it wasn't there. I was saying to myself, good, it'll happen in Oakland when we play them. At least we had one more shot at it. But it, like we uh, had the champagne there in Cleveland the next day, but it, 
It's, like I said, you can't fake it. The Sox might have been minus a celebration, but they were champions of the East and were headed home for the American League playoffs against the all-powerful and heavily favored champions of the West. As expected, the Oakland A's came with clout and in the fourth inning of game one, used it against Bruce Hurst when the A's biggest basher, Jose Canseco, unlocked a nothing-nothing tie. The A's added one more and went into the ninth inning leading two to one. Dennis Eckersley was entrusted with the lead and got out of a jam by striking out Wade Boggs to give Oakland a one-game edge. The odds may have been stacked against Boston, but if anyone could put the lid on Oakland's explosive bats, the Red Sox figured Roger Clemens could. And in game two, Rocket was up to his old stuff for six innings striking down the almighty A's. Red Sox bats helped out in the bottom of the sixth when Ellis Burks capped a rally that put Boston up two to nothing. But one inning later, Clemens got a jolt from Canseco, who hit a tremendous home run to tie the game. Both sides scored once more and went into the ninth all even at three. But Walt Weiss put Oakland ahead four to three. The Red Sox failed to score in their half of the ninth, and once again, the redoubtable Dennis Eckersley saved the day. In Oakland for game three, the Red Sox loosened up and finally let loose with their bats. Ellis Burks got things started by opening the game with a single, and thanks to a shakeup of the lineup, Boston sent nine men to the plate in the first inning and led three to nothing. Mike Greenwell snapped a postseason slump, driving in two of the runs, and suddenly, the team that couldn't win at the Coliseum all season was doing a little bashing of its own. Boston's bash continued, and in the second inning, Greenwell delivered heartily. This time, he helped put Boston's lead up to five to nothing. But the A's promptly and convincingly launched a comeback that demolished the Red Sox. Oakland scored six runs in two innings and went on to a 10 to six victory. Red Sox pennant hopes finally died in game four as the A's beat Boston four to one and with a clean sweep sailed into the World Series champions of the American League. The pain of losing would no doubt be hard to forget, but as Red Sox fans would long remember, theirs was a team that had been counted out halfway through the season, a team that had made a magical turnaround. To me, it just showed that these fellas really wanted to, to do better and were capable of doing better. It's like they said, well, this is it. We got to do it now, and we can do it. That, that was the biggest part about it. And when they did that, I, you know, I just knew it was going to be a good year. In his own quiet and unassuming way, Joe Morgan transformed the Red Sox into division champions, proving in the end that the magic of Joe Morgan is the man himself. There is a difference between being third base coach and being a manager. I mean, nobody knew how he'd handle a big league job like that. And uh, it's the same guy. That's the same Joe, and he did a great job. He just knew how to motivate us, and uh, we really took off for him. And, uh, you know, I, I, it was a great thing, and it was a great thing for the Red Sox, the fans, and, and a great thing for Joe Morgan. It makes you as a player really want to win, not only for the team, but for him. You know, when you really want to win for your manager, it, it, it could give you that little edge that gets you over the top. There's something I can give in exchange for everything you give to me. Read my mind, you make me feel just fine when I think my peace of mind is out of reach. The scales are sometimes unbalanced, and you bear the weight of all that hurts. 
has to be I hope you see that you can lean on me And together we can calm the stormy sea When life's so strong and so